you guys, isn't this an awesome day that God has given to us? Can you hear me now? Hey, thank you for coming here today. This is week two of our um, Table Talk um, conversations, and we hope you've enjoyed the first week. But today we're going to ask you to stand up, say hi to somebody you didn't come here with, and then tell them what shape of table you had when you were growing up. Oval, circular, square, or card table, whatever. Can you do that for me? Now? <laughs> Thanks. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to be together either online or here. And we would ask that in the name of Jesus that you will encourage us, that you will inspire us, but most importantly that you remind us that we are forgiven people. We are your children. And may that forgiveness so fill our heart, soul, and minds that we will just simply ex explode with the joy that you give to us as your child, as your forgiven child. I ask this in Jesus. Amen. Please join with me in seeing our opening hymn.
As we come and worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's go to the Lord in these words of confession this morning. We've been taught your will for us. Your word is very clear, but I am not sure that all your desire for me is what I want. I like some of those things that I are not of your will. I have learned not to call some of those things sins, but deep down I know they are. Forgive, restore, direct me in the name of Jesus. Lord, have mercy on me. In a few minutes, you'll hear the words read from Psalm 51, where David says, Have mercy on me, O God, and according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. And that is exactly what God has done for you, for us, for this world in Christ Jesus. And so your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Testament is taken from Psalm 51, 1 through 6. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Please rise for the gospel, Matthew chapter 5, 21 to 30. 
You have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. seen it. So we're in week two of our table conversations, and this week's table comes from a member that was very gracious to let me just kind of pop in their house, knock on the front door, and say, hey, can I take a picture of your, your, uh, of your table? So can we see the table? Here it is. And um, she, she said, well, it's, it's kind of dirty. I said, that's great. It's exactly what I want to show, because this is around this particular part of the house is where they do Play-Doh, they do crayons, they do read stories. It's how life is lived in this family of young children. And as you see um, as around this table also is that you will have meals and, and you, you, you practice uh, your conflict resolution where, you know, stop that, be nice to your brother and say you're sorry and you're, to your little brother and the, little, and the little brother says, or the older brother says, sorry. And the other one responds, forgive you. 
you know, and, and, and they go, this conflict resolution started at a very young age. You go through devotions, you teach them how to pray. And there's always that one food that, um, that one food that you, you can't leave the table unless you have a try. And for Pastor Greg last week, it was peas, and our family, beets was the number one bad one. But it's around this table that you practice those basic things of just basic behavior modification, teaching your children to have some sort of ability to communicate with each other. And again, when they have problems, you simply say, ask your brother for forgiveness. I'm sorry. And they say, forgive you. And, and, and you move on from that. And then they go to school. And they get exposed to kids who have different type of parenting styles. Parents that... Um, don't have the same maybe morals that you have. And, and then sometimes at school they get bullied. And they come home and go, what, what's going on, Mom and Dad? What, what happened here? Or they get excluded from being a part of something. Or they get included and someone else gets excluded and they don't know how to handle that. And you begin to, to realize all of a sudden, um, well, this is harder than I thought. And then they get involved in activities like, uh, you know, in football or, or soccer, or they do some sort of dance, and they get exposed to coaches that don't have, they have different have discipline uh, techniques, and their language is somewhat suspect, or even sometimes their religion is different. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, as soon as you, a parent will say, you know what, my child would never, at the table, they start nevering like they nevered before. And you said, what happened? We did exactly what our parents told us to do. They probably parented us. What happened? This is not exactly the way it's supposed to go. We thought we, thought we had all the answers. Then our five-year-old comes up with an idea or a question. There's no way I could answer this appropriately. What happened? And if you're wise at that moment, you'll say, it's okay. We'll get through it. No big deal. We'll learn from this. But at the table, you learn that even with two, five, and seven-year-olds, you need grace. Every one of those two, five, and seven-year-olds have different personalities, which means you need different parental styles. So this is going to be the first time I think we're going to try it. We're going to ask everyone to raise your hand if you agree with the statement, even if you're not one. And if you mess this up, it'd be the first, only church service that doesn't do it right. <laughs> there's, no, there's no manipulation here, okay? So, how many would agree with this statement? Parenting is hard. Yeah, and that can happen. This is awesome. Yeah, um, we think we've got it all figured out, and then get this kid, the second kid, or the third kid that comes to you going, I don't have it all figured out. What's even get more frustrating is when um, you come home and you've had a bad day or things are going bad for your, in, in your life and this kid who doesn't know any better because you haven't been taught or just doesn't know any better does or says something and you just fly off the handle and it's not their fault. Then you realize you need grace. And sometimes you fly off the handle in a very bad way. It's humbling, it's realistic. Everyone that around that table is imperfect. Individuals, child or parent. So, we've all done the nevering that we never thought we would. And that's why this psalm today that was read is so appropriate. Why don't you read it with me? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. This is a psalm that David wrote um, after he had been confronted by the prophet Nathan. Nathan had gone to the prophet and confronted him with murder, adultery, deception. And he had to do it in a very, very soft way because this is David, the king of Israel. And so he told him this story and he knew David would fall for it. Story about a man who lost his one little lamb uh, to another person, and he got very angry, and said, so you are the man, and then David said, okay. Now, David's a man after God's heart, and it was obvious that, um, that God had chosen David because the king of Israel was the visible representation of God. The king of Israel was God, 
And yet, he permitted to have a king in Jerusalem so he would be the visible representative of, of God on earth. And David was a good one. David, um, David honored his Lord when, when he could have killed Saul. David had killed Goliath. David was a, vi- was a powerful warrior, gifted musician. Uh, he was a great articulate man. He had God in many ways. So David would never, ever, ever do that to Bathsheba and Uriah, one of his better friends. Right? Never. Nathan confronted David. David acknowledged his mistakes. He got caught nevering that he never, never should have done. And so he begins the psalm. I'm sorry. And what's really cool about these words of Psalm 51 is that he could have made this psalm particularly for just the sins that he had committed against Uriah and Bathsheba and against God. But instead, he made it very, very broad so we can use this psalm very, very often and allow the the audience, whoever hears it, to connect with it very, very clearly and intimately. David spoke these words, and of course, God forgave them. He put aside his sin. And um, David went on from this embarrassing episode of his life. There was shame there. But for the rest of David's reign, if you read the story, the whole narrative of David, you know that in that story, there was conflict in his family. Even one of his sons, Absalom, rebelled against him. And David kind of uh, went into exile like a wounded little puppy dog. He, he didn't go back as the, 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 the strong warrior king that he was. He went back as a very sheepish man. And so I wonder sometimes, I've always been wondered, I guess, Um, Did David ever really forgive himself? God said he forgave him, but did he ever forgive himself? When good and godly successful people are exposed, it's very hard for them to recover from that mistake. Sometimes they walk away from God. Sometimes they um, walk around with shame. You know, they, they don't look at anyone's eyes anymore. Sometimes they become very legalistic. I don't want anyone else to go through this. And sometimes they just walk away from God altogether, even though they've been forgiven. So why this very sad Sunday school story on this beautiful day that God has given to us? Because there's too many of us that walk in and out of churches all across our country, all across our world, who have never, like they've never before, had heard God forgive them, and forget what they were taught as a two, five, and seven-year-old. Say you're sorry. I forgive you. Move on. You know, it, it seems so naive and so childish. But what we learned around that table is so very, very important. I'm sorry. You're forgiven. So if you're one of those people this morning, we're going to gather around God's table. And once again, we're going to hear God speak to us. I know what you've done. I know that you know what you've done. I know you've never, like you never thought you would, and you keep doing that never. But at the same time, I forgive you. I forgive you. So you come to this table and say, God, have mercy on me. And God has a conversation with you. I know you've done what you've done. I know you know what you've done. But I want you to see something. You see that? You heard it over and over again. My son died for you on that cross. When you eat the bread and you drink the wine, you're going to taste that you are forgiven. You're going to experience that you're forgiven. He is risen. He's risen. You've heard the story over and over again. In the resurrection of Jesus, it is stamped permanently on every Christian's heart. You are forgiven, victorious over all. I forgive you, says God. And hopefully, we can walk away praising God, excited about what God has done. We can do what David says right later on in the psalm, create me a clean heart, O God, or restore to me the joy of salvation and not walk out of here doubting that you have been forgiven. Because around this table, you have said, I'm sorry. And God has said, I forgive you. Even if you keep vowing, I will never do what I said I would never do, I would never do what I did this again, and you keep doing it over again, I still forgive you. Over and over again. Because the sad outcome of many people 
who have forgotten what they learned in 2, 5, and 7 is that God does really forgive us and we can move on. Honestly, move on. And so there, there's a saying that, that, that we practice that uh, I'm right on the board. I have no idea who wrote it. Um, I thought it was kind of cool, but I just want you know, just to think about this. For any of us in this room who are religious, those of us in this room who are successful, those of us who don't want anyone to know that we've made a mistake, here's what I want you to read and to think about real quickly. The heartfelt conviction and confidence of our acceptance in Christ makes it easier to admit we are flawed. Because we know we won't be cast off if we confess the the true depths of our sinfulness. Our hope is in Christ's righteousness, not my own. What that means when you walk out of here, Christ has made you holy, pure, and precious. Okay? So when you say, I'm sorry, Christ has given you his forgiveness. And you can look at someone else's eyes who's the same forgiven person equally. So, it's not so traumatic to admit our weaknesses and laps when you come to this table today, God the Father's table, and you say, God, honestly, I've done this. And God will tell you, I forgive you. Please walk out of here with confidence. The psalm in this, the Psalm 51, is not about being perfect. It's about being a healthy human being. It's about being a healthy human being who has healthy relationships without hypocritical masks. You learn, um, we, we learn in Psalm 51 how to be mentally healthy by acknowledging I am not going to be perfect, but I'm going to try my best to do my best. And also to be spiritually healthy. We hear this often, we rarely believe it. Our past rarely or does not define us. That does not define you. Nor does it have to take the wind out of our sails, even if we've been forgiven, and walk around like a dog with his tail between his legs. We are forgiven people. So, you come to the stable, we're going to practice what we've been taught as a two and five and six year old. I'm sorry, you're forgiven. Hey, let's have dessert. Let's move on. Just have on, move on. In Christ, we are a renewed person. When you come to this table and you leave, you are a renewed person. You're smarter, you're wiser, you're healthier. And you don't have to put on a mask that you're perfect because you're not. You're just forgiven in Jesus. Amen. What a blessing to know the forgiveness of God for us and for the person across the table and to be able to come to God's table today and receive his gifts as well. I pray that you're encouraged as we, as the church and as people and even in this world, learn to work out that forgiveness, to to live in that forgiveness with one another and share it with each other. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's fast and sometimes it takes a long time, but may God be with us in doing so. We're also grateful for all the ways that you do that here together, the ways that you serve and the ways that you give, and continue to pray that God will bless those grateful hearts, yours, that have given, and he will also bless the offerings that we give for the growth of his kingdom and to the glory of his name. There's an opportunity you have coming up here in February uh, to support um, the uh, sanctity of life, and and Lily's going to share with you about that. Great. I'm going to encourage you to stand, and we're going to speak our faith this morning in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, 
and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we enter into the time of prayer. Just a reminder, if you want the list of prayers that we go through on Sundays, those prayer requests are for you as you uh, are out in the lobby today. But, but as we enter into this time of prayer, we just also want to recognize uh, that as we talk about forgiveness and sitting around the table, it's not always just as easy as talking about it. There are some relationships that have been deeply, deeply hurt. There's some things that are really hard to forgive. There's some of us who have been abandoned or have suffered much at the hands of someone else. 
there's deep guilt or shame that we might be carrying. And so it's not always real simple. So in this moment, as we enter into a time of prayer, we just encourage you to think about who might be a person in your life that's hard to work out forgiveness with, or someone that you need to seek forgiveness from, and recognize that it's not always a split second, but it sometimes takes a while. And so let's ask God in these moments that the Holy Spirit would just begin to chip away at those things, that we might know the forgiveness that is ours and theirs and begin to live that together as he walks us through it. So I encourage you to take a moment of prayer. Almighty God, as we come before you today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to well up within us that trust that comes from the gift of faith which you have given. Because some afflictions are very deep, some difficulties, some hurts and pains and wounds are very deep and will take time. We pray that you will continue or begin to, to chip away at that. Remind us of your grace for us and your mercy and that for others as well so that healing and restoration may come just as in Christ Jesus you have restored us to yourself. And so now we pray that you will hear and answer these prayers that are on our hearts and minds this morning. We pray that you would be with, with those who are in need of your peace, strength, and healing. For those going through physical ailments and the peace, strength, and healing that is needed as we work to forgive one another. So this morning, be with Herb and Sarah and Monica, for Jan and Brett, Jeff, Marianne, Ryan, Colton, and Brian. We're thankful for those who have come through surgery or failing health and that you have provided recovery. For those who have surgery upcoming, we pray that you would uh, grant your peace uh, as they go into that time. And may you provide a full recovery for all. For those battling cancer, we pray for Chris and Verlene, for Todd and Pat, Leanne, for Janice and Grace, and for Robbie. We ask that you would rid them of cancer, but grant them strength and perseverance of faith in this time as well, a quality of life, even in the midst of this difficult diagnosis. We're grateful for the ways that your word is at work here among us and around the world, and we pray that you be with those who bring it to the ends of the earth. Be also with those who govern and who lead us here locally and nationally. May they do so faithfully, and may you grant them your wisdom and discernment in fulfilling those roles. Be with those who provide and for us, who grant us safety and protection, who care for us in many ways. We pray you would grant them safety. For the men and women of our military, our law enforcement, our firefighters and medical responders, that you would also edify them in this good work that you have given them to do. May you grant your peace, your comfort, the restoration in your time for those who are grieving and mourning the loss of loved ones. We lift to you the family of Buddy Ferris and for Ken and Hazel Stansberry and family at the home going of their daughter Linda but also give us grateful, thankful, and joyful hearts as we see you at work in our lives. Whether that be through the forgiveness sought and shared amongst family and amongst the church or with healing that you have brought or other things. And so today we praise you and we thank you that uh, Karen, the friend of uh, Jennifer Nowicki, and Karen and her husband were uh, able to um, have a, a wonderful visit to the hospital with their their son, and that you are providing answers to keep them calm and peaceful, and we pray that that will continue, that it might be a blessing within their family. Well, for these prayers and, and all others that are on our hearts and on our minds today, we lift them to you. We commend them into your almighty hands, trusting again in the risen name of our Savior Jesus, who has taught us to pray, and we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to enter into communion, we just want to encourage you that our prayer team is available for you. If you'd like to have someone pray with you or for you, um, they'll be available as you return to your seats from the communion table uh, back of the, the back of our sanctuary. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So may the peace of the Lord be with you always, and welcome to the Lord's table. Amen. Child of God. 
unto the fatherless, defender of the weak. Freedom for the prisoner, we sing. This is God in his holy place. This is God clothed in love and strength. Sing out, lift your voice and cry out. Awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. He went the sin, the wilderness. Faithful to provide every breath and every step we see. This is God in His holy place. This is God clothed in love and strength. Sing out, lift your voice and cry out. Awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. Sing out, raise your hands and shout out. Awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. There is no higher door. our strong God, mighty is our God. Sing out, raise your hands and shout out, awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. There is no higher 
And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and our Savior Jesus strengthen and preserve you in true faith now and into life everlasting as you go from his table with forgiveness, grace, and his peace. Amen. I invite you to stand. Receive this blessing of the Lord and then we'll sing his praises together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace as you enjoy this beautiful day that he has given you as a gift. Amen.
Till the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul From the day you saved my soul Till the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul From the day you saved my soul